Today we're going to talk about miracles. Uh, but I'm not going to get sidetracked into explaining why I believe miracles happen. You know I love apologetics. We, we often get into that, but that's not the focus today. I believe miracles are happening all the time. Uh, if you're a Christian, you already believe in a God who responds to prayer, who sees and understands our circumstances, although we don't always act like it. Uh, with the history of answered prayer, how often do we forget to pray? And the reason is, is because we're not holding up an Ebenezer, a stone of remembrance. We're not remembering, oh yeah, God answered me at this time. God came to me in my sadness at this time. God sustained me at this time. We forget all the answered prayer. And so the next, next time of trouble seems insurmountable. It seems to be too much before us. We need to recall God's goodness. We need to hold on to these stories these, uh, of God working uh, in our lives and in our families and in our church. We need to remember these things, hold on to these things, and next time, pray again. If you doubt this morning or question the reality of miracles, I would say to you, go out and look at the stars at night. Uh, listen to birds singing. Isn't it uh, an amazing, wonderful thing? There are maybe a trillion planets out there. I don't know what life is on all those places, but we got to be on a planet where when the sun rises, it's gorgeous. We don't have cloud cover all the time unless you're in Seattle or London. Uh, we get to see this beautiful sunrise. We get to see the stars. We get to dream what's out there. And we get to be greeted in the morning by music. I mean, come on, God. You made music in nature so we could wake up and hear all the birds singing. Listen to the sound of water on a shore and realize it didn't have to be that way. That create, came out of the creativity of God himself. Think about, think about this. Close your eyes for a moment. Uh, some of you aren't trusting me. I'm not going to throw anything at you. This, this time. Close your eyes for a moment. And now imagine the things that you had said. Just a, okay, Dwayne, open up your eyes. He's falling asleep on me. Oh, babe, you better all wake up. Yeah, open up your eyes. Bad illustration. There's things up here right now. You see this? What is this? Oh, some of you are sharp. Yeah. Music stand. What is this? Chair. Chair. What's, yeah, there's a stool. What's this? Thank you. Pulpit. That's right. How did you guys know that? Well. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. No, uh, you saw it, right? You saw it. You ever think about that? Everything around you, including yourself, we're just made up of, Carl Sagan would say, stardust. You know? We're just made up of everything you see is atoms combined in a different way. Everything you see is atoms combined in a different way. And somehow, a clump of atoms over there that we're calling curtains, and I'm a clump of atoms over here we call Dan, light hits that, bounces off that, comes to me. I'm seeing texture. I'm seeing shape. I'm seeing color. Close your eyes. Wow. How can I know things about things that are in front of me without being in contact with them? That's an amazing, amazing thing that God set up there. And if you're close enough or, or you don't have a cold or allergies, you can probably detect things with your, with your nose around you as well and, and with our ears. What an amazing, you know, that we, you know, if aliens come to our planet, what they see is just a cluster of sensory receptors, okay? Oh, well, that person's beautiful. That person's like, well, it's just a cluster of sensory receptors. Uh, but God made it, and it's beautiful, and it's amazing. And uh, how can we say, how can we look at the stars and think about all the trillions of galaxies, uh, uh, 100 trillion galaxies, all the, all, everything that's out there, and then say, well, I don't think that God could turn water into wine. Oh, come off it. You're not, you don't, you don't, you don't got a big enough imagination going on there. Uh, if God can do all that, he can pretty much do whatever he wants. So today's message, I'm not trying to convince you miracles happen. Uh, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've seen God do amazing things. And I've seen God do so many amazing things that there's no way anybody could convince me that God doesn't act in a miraculous way. Uh, I'm also, though, not a, mir a miracle junkie. I almost went with a different phrase. I opted not to. Uh, I'm not a miracle junkie. When God blesses, sometimes as a result of prayer, sometimes God blesses unexpectedly, I really want to respond with a heart of gratitude. But sometimes I worry that myself and 
in Christians, we can get too caught up in the fireworks and the special effects. Does God do something special? And my first thought is not thank you, it's do it again. God does something wonderful and I just want to see it again. I just want to sit back and see a show. I don't want to be a miracle junkie. I want to be thankful to the giver of good gifts. The danger is that people can start to see God like a cosmic vending machine. Push the right buttons and you get what you want. Push a button. Put in 50 cents, I get my Coke. Push a button. Say a magic prayer and God gives me what I want. Doesn't work like that. How insulting to God who loves us for ourselves to see him as a cosmic uh, vending machine. How sad to see him as a machine doling out prizes and treats like some giant Santa Claus up in space. And people start to love the gifts more than the gift giver. And that's sad. So I believe in miracles. We see them all the time. And I don't harp on it all the time because I'm more interested in loving God and learning to follow him because he's so good. He's so much better than myself. I don't see any hope in here. I, I don't see much that's encouraging here. I see a lot that's encouraging up there. And he's, he loves me despite all that. And he wants us to love each other. And I think, oh, yeah, that sounds good to me. Beats the alternative. I can be all tied up and tight and angry and bitter. That stuff is from below. There's nothing good there. So I want to love the giver of good gifts, somebody who loved me enough to die for me, rose again to give me this new life that's bigger than myself. In our study of Matthew, we've seen Jesus warn against this attitude of loving to see miracles in chapters 12 and 16 already. People were pressing Jesus to do another miracle, do a miracle for him. Come on, Jesus, do a miracle. Uh, like, come on, roll over, roll over, you know, like a puppy, like God's some, some big puppy. And, and he did not come to earth to perform tricks. He came to teach us about the kingdom of God. He came to teach us the kinds of people that God wants his children to be. And ultimately, he came to sacrifice himself, to die on the cross. He substituted himself for us. We deserve eternal separation from God. We deserve punishment for our sins. Heaven is a perfect place. I can't get there because of what I've said and done and thought. Because I'm fallen. I'm messed up. Jesus took all my guilt, all my shame, every nasty thing I've ever thought, every wicked thing I've ever said to anybody, any time I've mistreated somebody, he took all that garbage on himself and the weight of this darkness at that moment, for the first time ever, Jesus was separated from the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. First time ever, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This point was far worse than the physical pain of suffering on the cross. It's when our sin was laid upon him. He took my place, took my punishment because he loved me. He took it when I didn't care about him, when I didn't think about him, when I was too busy for him. He says, Dan, I love you. And I say, okay, I'll take that. Dan, I want to forgive you. And, okay, I'll take that. Dan, I have a new life for you. And I say, all right. And then I get sidetracked and bitter, and I think, oh, man, uh, he's done so much for me. And I've turned, I turn around, and he's right there, and he said, come on back, come on back. I feel, oh, I feel so far from God today. Whoa, whoa, you're right there still. <laughs> come on back, Dan, come on back. I feel so far walking, walking the wrong direction. All I see is darkness and hopelessness and disappointment, disappointed with life, disappointed with myself, disappointed with circumstances. I turn around, and there's God. Come on back. God took my place. He paid the ultimate price for my sin because he wants to forgive me. He wants to have an intimate relationship with each one of us. We were created to have a relationship with God. And that's why this world doesn't seem right. It's right for goldfish, right for gophers, right for sequoias, right for clouds and rocks and whatever else. We know it's something wrong because we're created to be in relationship with God and we're out of whack with the universe. Everything else is humming along the way it's supposed to. We're not. We're messed up. Jesus wants me to come back to him. He took my place, and I want to say thank you, and I don't want to view him as a vending machine. Can I get an amen on that? Let's not see God as a vending machine. 
And so when people press him to do a miracle, you know what he told them? He told them it's an evil and adulterous generation, people that crave miracles. Evil because they're what? Focusing on God or other people? No, they're focusing on their flesh. They're focusing on themselves. What can I get out of church? What can I get out of this? What can I? It's all focusing on self instead of loving God. Love is always outward looking. Evil, Jesus says. And it's adulterous because they love the gifts more than the gift giver. If we put anything before God, to God it feels like adultery. You're cheating on me. You're putting something else first. In fact, miracles in the Bible are never ends in themselves. And yet we treat it like the end. Oh, God, the greatest possible good could ever be would be you heal me of this cancer. If you have cancer, pray. God heals. But listen, that's not the greatest possible good. The greatest possible good is we get in a relationship with God. Other people get in a relationship with God. God is going to finish cancer once and for all, but he's not doing it right now. He's doing that at the culmination of time when he's called in everybody who will listen and turn and repent. We have a short-sighted view. I can pray and pray and pray. God, I'm 120. I need another 10 years, you know. Pray and pray and pray. God, you don't love me because you don't give me a sports car. <laughs> you know I want a sports car. I've seen that before. It's usually in Kmart in the toy section, by the way. Uh, I need it. Give it to me now. I'm not talking about my kids, by the way. My kids looked at me incredulously like, no. I, I mean, I've seen it. So, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Miracles are never the end in themselves. They're always a tool God uses or a sign that helps people to see God. Miracles point us towards God. They're not the end. They're not the primary goal. And, you know, whatever you pray with and however God answers it, you know, I always feel like Lazarus got a bum deal there, didn't he? He had to die twice. I mean, it wasn't anything great for him, but the miracle pointed to Jesus as the giver of life. It was an important miracle in the Bible. But, I mean, dying once, that's, that's enough, thank you. Whatever we're praying for, whatever we're going through, the moment we step into eternity, we'll wonder what all the fuss was about. Wow. Think about the healing miracles did. There seems to be a lot of miracles in the Bible in Jesus' time, right? You know what, what strikes me when I read that? Why did he do so few? Why did he do so few? Jesus hardly did anything. He walked around in a few small cities. He could have gone... No more heart disease. No more cancer. No more whatever. It's all gone. Jesus could, if his mission was to come and heal, he could have just finished that right then, right there when he was on earth. Why did Jesus do so few miracles? Couldn't he have just, I mean, he could have, right? All hardships, no, no more burn victims. He can jump in the fire, you'll be fine. Do you ever wonder why he did so few? His purpose was never to come to do a bunch of flashy miracles and to make fallen people feel comfortable in a fallen world. This world is subject to futility, not of its own will, but of his. So that we will turn and we will see our need. We'll fall out because in eternity... Even a comfortable eternity, living in a fallen world with my broken, fallen hearts, do you really think, I love my wife dearly, my best friend, I don't trust myself to be able to love her for 10,000 years this side of heaven? Janesville, Wisconsin, as close to heaven as you can get. Listen, unless God does something for us on the inside, we make this place hell for one another. We don't want to live forever here. We want to get polished up and cleaned up. We want to get changed and transformed. As he's promised when we put our faith in him, he says, he has began a good work in you. He's not going to stop. He's not going to give up until he's finished his job. And we will be like him, and we will be made pure and perfect. And we're not going to look at people and have different motives going on in our heads. We're not going to... We're not going to have any shadow of darkness fleeting before our eyes. We're going to love as we were intended to love from a pure heart. We're going to receive love and, and not worry or hold back or wonder what's the agenda or anything. That's what we were meant for. And that's what God has in store for us. Jesus didn't come to 
just make us feel comfortable in a fallen world. That was never his agenda. It wasn't then. It's not his purpose now. Jesus didn't do miracles so that we could avoid hardship and tears and pain. What he did were signs so that people could understand who he was and accept the fact, listen, he's not just saying he's going to die for our sins. He's going to do it. And he rose again to say, when I promise you eternal life, listen, people, I can deliver because here I am. Jesus did miracles so that people would see him. And what's the point of doing miracles today if we're just going to turn around and say, do it again? We need to see Jesus. We need to know him. We need to humble ourselves to him. Let's turn now to Matthew chapter 20, 29 through 34. How are we all doing? We still fighting to stay awake? Yeah? All right. 29 through 34. Two blind men receive sight. Oh, Dan, you don't believe this story, right? This is a metaphor. No, of course I believe it. Jesus, again, look at the sky, look at the stars, look at everything around you. If God can do that, he can heal two blind guys. That's not a surprise. That's nothing, nothing too big for God. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed them. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David. Messianic title, right? Dad was pointing this out. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd, even though they're following Jesus, they might not have been ready for him to be identified as God in flesh, as the Messiah. So the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they didn't listen to the crowd, did they? They shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called to them, What do you want me to do for you? Isn't that beautiful? This morning, if you could ask God, God would hear and said, What do you want me to do for you? What would you answer? And I thought in my heart, Oh, God. I'm tired of all the conflicting motivations in me. I'm tired of dealing with myself. God, I just want to love you and love to love you and serve you from a pure heart. And what a joy that would be to get over myself, right? To just be able to love God from a pure heart. And God, please. And uh, God said, I'm not going to give you the easy button. You know, the staples, push a button. Okay, I can sign my name and now I don't have to deal with myself anymore. No, but brothers and sisters, as we go through life, learning to surrender ourselves to God. Jesus Christ said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. Brothers and sisters, love means looking out for the people around us, not looking inside ourselves, not here to please ourselves. As we go through life and we struggle with this selfishness, guess what? It brings more glory to God than an easy button because you say, wow, that person's broken just like me, and they're really trying hard to be a good forgiver. They're broken just like me, but they are loving people. They're, they're putting themselves out when they're weary and tired to care for one another. They're not writing people off. They're not getting offended and walking away. This glorifies God when through our struggles, people can see Jesus Christ flowing through. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. So, if Jesus were here and said, what can I do for you? The red Lamborghini is actually not the correct answer. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes immediately. Immediately they received their sight and they followed him. Last chapter, when the mother of James and John, remember that? Remember how awesome that was? The great apostles, James and John, get their mommy to come, and they ask Jesus for a favor. They want, like, high positions, and they thought he was going to establish an earthly, earthly kingdom because they weren't getting it yet. And uh, remember what Jesus said to her when she came? What do you wish? Isn't that cool? Again, going to God. God says, well, what do you wish? What are you wishing for? You know what? Heaven is open for everybody who wishes for it. I wish heaven was real. I'm so messed up. I wish there was a real God who could forgive me. Heaven is for you. Turn to God. What do you wish? And she asked for something selfish, and God blessed her anyways. Here is the response to the two blind men. What do you want me to do for you? Now notice that in the case of James and John, God didn't answer them with the answer they wanted. 
They wanted to be an earthly kingdom. They wanted to be like vice kings or something. But he did answer them. He did tell them that they would endure harsh trials, which is one of those things where you, well, gee, thanks, God. It's not what I was asking for. In fact, they were, they were prophesied they're going to die for their faith, right? But ultimately, he says, he assures them that it would be worth it. So he says, you're going to go through hard times, but trust me, it's going to be worth it. And he gives them this assurance. And here he says yes to the two blind men. But in both cases, Jesus listened when people called out to him. Brothers and sisters, be confident that when you pray, he is listening and saying to you, what would you like me to do? That's the attitude. We don't have to try to, oh, God, please listen to me. Please, I know... I know you're a busy guy. I know I'm not that important. No, no, no. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. He loves you, and he's right there to listen to you. He's sitting right at your bedside when you pray. He's right there sitting in the car when you're driving. Don't close your eyes when you pray in the car. Uh, he's there with us in every single situation. Open up, call out to him, and he said, he'll say, what do you want me to do? What would you have me do? Why wouldn't we talk more with a good God like that? Also note that they didn't stop when people told them to shut up. The world is going to say, don't need to hear about your faith. You're welcome to sit down and shut up. Well, I'm not going to stop praying because somebody else doesn't like it. The people around them told them to stop calling upon Jesus Christ, and they did not listen. From this we learn that we should seek God passionately and not give up when other people don't understand. Some people just don't get it. Why? Sometimes the world is a noisy place. Sometimes the world is an angry place. Keep calling out to God. Keep praying. He will hear you. He will. And their prayer was for their eyes to be open. And brothers and sisters, even if our physical eyes are, are working a day, and I think all of you still got them open, uh, we need to pray and call out that our spiritual eyes will be wide open, that we'll be wide awake in our souls. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 2, 9-11, through 11, The one who says he's in the light, because he needs light to see, and yet hates his brother, is in darkness. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. We need to come to Jesus saying, Lord, I want to see. You notice? They acknowledged him as king. They put him first. Not, okay, God, here's the deal. You're going to do this, this, this way, this way, and this way. And if you don't do it, I'm going to be upset with you. And I'm going to pout and I'm going to be angry. No, they came humbly. You are the king. You're God. I ain't. You are up there. I'm appealing to you because you're God. So, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. This morning, are you just here? Or do you want to see? Or did you just come here out of tradition or because you're an American, American, you know, cultural Christianity or something? Or did you come here and say, I want to see God. I'm here and God opened my eyes. I want to see you as you really are. So today, two questions. Are you willing to bow down before God as your Lord? Because the king will tell us to do things and go places we might not want to say or do or go? Are we willing to acknowledge God as king? And secondly, do you really want to see him? I mean, really? Maybe you don't. Because sometimes when our spiritual eyes are open, what happens when you've got dirty hands? You know the dimmer switches, it turns on a little bit, oh, looks clean to me, turn on a little more, oh yeah, a little powdery. Turn on a little more, whoa. Turn on a little more, wow. Turn on full power. I'm filthy. When we walk in the dark, it's easy to excuse everything about our attitudes and behaviors. When we come close to Jesus, he's going to show us things about ourselves we might not want to see. And that's when repentance time comes. That's come to Jesus time. We humble ourselves, say, Lord, forgive. I've been a hard head. Lord, forgive. I'm so unforgiving. I'm so ungracious. Lord, forgive. I'm so self-centered and self-righteous and judgmental and Lord, forgive. I want to be more like you. So, do I want to acknowledge he's the king? Or do I really want to see? Now look what happens next. Jesus was moved with compassion. He loved it. 
He loved that prayer for them to be healed. And the truth, in this true event, this is a true event that happened in history. It's recorded here. In the life of Christ is another example of God playing. He's playing out a spiritual reality in a physical world. And we learn a beautiful truth here. If we humble ourselves, acknowledge Christ as Lord, and call out to have our eyes opened, he will be moved with compassion, and we will see. And they saw, and what did they do? They followed him. Today's sermon is, what to do when a miracle happens to you? Because you're living in a world of miracles. And the proper response is to follow. Be grateful. By the way, following means I'm behind. I'm not leading God. I'm following God. When God blesses us, what we should do, what, we should, what should we do? Gratitude will lead us to follow him, to put him first in our lives and go where he goes. When you're following, you go where he goes. Jesus went to some difficult places to love people. If you're going to follow Jesus, you may be led to some difficult places in order to show love towards people, even when they mistreat you because, remember, people mistreated Christ. We need you to remember God's goodness, remember his miracles, humble ourselves, respond in gratitude, and simply get up. I'm dying, I can't see. Oh, thank you, God. Get up and follow him. We don't have to figure out the whole world. We don't have to have all the answers. We have to follow. The greatest gift God ever gave was himself, and he loved us enough to die for our sins. There's no greater love than this, no greater blessing. The book of Proverbs tells us that the beginning of the wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is to fear God. If we aren't grateful for that cross, if we're not filled with gratitude for what Christ has done for us, we are ignoring a great and undeserved salvation bought at a tremendous price. I don't want to be an ungrateful little jerk. All things being equal. Thank you, Jesus. God loves you. There's no denying it. He died for you. Look at the way he's blessed you in your life. God loves you. He's willing to wash away your sins. This is the greatest gift of all, the greatest blessing possible. There is nothing better he can give us. And the choice is ours. We either rejoice and follow him or we turn away in unbelief. I said earlier, we need to remember God's miracles. I want to recall another miracle. Look at verse 29. It tells us that Jesus is leaving a certain city. What's the name of the city? Jericho. Over 1,000 years before Christ, God brought down the walls of that mighty city. By the way, a lot of historians think, uh, uh, historians think that Jericho is the oldest city on the planet. There's, there's remains and and pottery and stuff that goes back like 11,000 years. It's the oldest city on the planet, and it's right there in the Bible. And it was an old city at the time uh, that Joshua went through there. And uh, through great miracle, the people obeyed what God called them to do. God brought the walls crashing down. And today, what's a fortress in your own heart? Is it pride? Is it anger? Is it bitterness? Is it pain? Has somebody hurt you or abused you? Is it greed? Selfish ambition, what's the stronghold in your heart? And the same God that brought the walls of Jericho crashing down can bring that crashing down in our lives, and we're so caught up in bitterness and anger and disappointment, and he can release us to this new life of living for him with forgiveness. Let's turn to him in simple faith and acknowledge him as our king. Brothers and sisters, do you want to be free? Then pray trust, call out to him, and then let's open our eyes, get up off of the ground, and just follow. Simple. Don't have to have all the answers. Don't have to know everything. God is good. He will listen with compassion. Romans 10, 13 tells us that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Instead of a prayer today, I'm going to end by reading a portion of Psalm 42, but if you think you can stay awake, you can bow your head and close your eyes as I read. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and the earths and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and, whose, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. 
I will also hold you by my hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. It's a command. Sing his praise to the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you and the islands and all who dwell on them, sing to the Lord a new song. Brothers and sisters, how do you respond when a miracle happens to you? Sing out to the Lord. Praise God. Get up off the ground. Follow him wherever he goes. And let's do that as individuals, as families, and as a church. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.